Good morning. Uh, we are just in practice mode for a moment. I'm going to put the share screen up. Perfect. All right. We are going to begin the uh, broadcast in just a few moments. So um, that's going to be happening as we speak. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are beginning uh, our live uh, webinar series. Um, I am uh, happy to be here. My name is Stephen Goldstein, and um, I'm looking forward to, to sharing with you um, uh, fascial therapy. So we're gonna put the uh, slide slow, slide show into uh, the format. And um, let's go ahead and have a chat about the fascial therapy. So this is the introduction, the theory behind fascial therapy. Uh, the purpose, uh, my hope is for sort of the worldwide audience to understand what I've been teaching for, oh my goodness, so for so many years. Uh, it is uh, a hybrid modality um, with a variety of soft tissue approaches. So the hallmark of fascial therapy, what used to be known as uh, integrative fascial release, um, was the ability to blend uh, different modalities in, and try to target as much of the soft tissue uh, that we can uh, with the fascial core and a nervous system core to create as rapid and as quick a change as possible. So the autonomic nervous system really is a very important factor in the foundation teaching of fascial therapy. And we're gonna unpack that a little bit today. Um, I recognize that this webinar will be seen by uh, folks all over the planet. So um, some of you are live in Australia and many of you will see this as a, um, a recording later uh, in the UK and Europe and South Africa and India and, and the United Arab Emirates, et cetera. So again, thank you for coming on board. Uh, what do we do with fascial therapy? Well. Uh, generally, fascial therapy is able to address and assist both uh, systemic and chronic dysfunctions. So by teaching a practitioner how to use lighter touch, they can work not only with uh, regional and structural uh, soft tissue presentations, but they can really affect a um, systemic uh, lowering of sympathetic dominance. And this is what we're going to get into a little bit later to talk about why that is so important for you as a practitioner to consider. So again, reiterating, um, it tends to, when I initially did uh, integrative fascial release, um, there were three uh, broad methods that I was interested in working with. The nervous system, and how to use mechanical or direct approaches because that's pretty much what was taught uh, when I was teaching in the 90s. And also realizing that also facilitated movement approaches can be used. And this is sort of later morphed into sort of the use of active movement participation, the use of contract relax. But also it's the awareness that you gain from say Pilates, um, the awareness that you gain uh, from Feldenkrais or Alexander or yoga. Uh, these are things that you as a practitioner can bring to the table. So what, what type, of, um, what type of, of soft tissue does it address? Well, it addresses uh, mild fascia, ligaments, joints, muscle, tendon, and neural structure. Now my screen up here has got a, a little Q&A going, so I'm going to pause for a second and just see what um, if they can reply. So I'm going to just say um, uh, answer by text, and then I'll try to get back to these if I can. 
Uh, remember, uh, Rachel, this will be um, a, a replay text for you as well. So I'll try to monitor any of the questions that come in while we do this. Um, okay, so let's continue. Now, one of the hallmarks of things that I do with teaching with fossil therapy is to recognize that I want to hold a three-dimensional uh, intent. And to that extent, when I'm teaching individuals in workshop settings, uh, I really am trying to foster a three-dimensional approach. Um, I try to have them move from global and macro into sort of local and micro. I think part of the problem is the fixation of a regional presentation keeps you sort of regional when in fact a uh, regional presentation will have a lot of compensation and this type of compensation has to be addressed and in fact some of the greatest changes you get are not by working the area directly but by working the area indirectly you can improve up to sometimes 25 30 degrees of say shoulder abduction if you know how to work uh, the latissimus area the serratus anterior area if you're working um, you know, the, the erectors like the iliocostalis, if you can mobilize uh, a rib on a spine, all that's gonna improve scapular function, which in turn is gonna improve glenohumeral function. So this idea that everything is connected and we follow these global patterns, we look at patterns and a template of many patterns to be addressed. Now, one of the things I also do for years is I've put an airbed uh, I don't have a photo of it here, but I put an airbed on, uh, uh, we call them lilos down here in Australia, but I put an airbed on the table and I tie it down with a sheet and it allows me to float, to, so to take that bottom hand and, and do something with it in relation to the top hand. So that's another thing about sort of playing three-dimensionally using two hands at once, which later we, you'll understand is what I call in the osteopaths uh, call stacking. And so this three-dimensional approach allows me to work with a form-oriented approach. So functional plasticity allows us to move tissue uh, and manipulate it more quickly once you sort of know how. Once we only talk a little later about well, if you get out of just compression loading, if you just think that the only way to work three dimensionally is somehow to you, you're going to press it all out to change it in its entirety of the form. And I've sort of got to get the folks when I'm teaching to think really differently about their touch applications. So we combine uh, compression and tensile force and tension. And I think that really doves very nicely with an idea of what uh, tensegrity concept was all about. And that's a pretty important concept in uh, the fascial community these days, uh, because tensegrity uh, really looks at, and if we go back a second, you see this three-dimensional model. Uh, this model is really a tensegrity model. And so uh, we now know that the biologically the body behaves in a manner that is, has a tensegrity concept at its heart all the way down to a, a cellular level. So we can begin to think about those concepts and try to then figure a way to bring those concepts to the table in real time in a real clinical environment. And in order to do that then, you use the basic principles of tensegrity, which is compression and tension, uh, to your advantage to create soft tissue change. Now, let's talk about the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system was the benchmark of my foundational understanding of what I was going to do when I work with a body and a client every single session. I learned this uh, from Michael Shea in the early 90s. He had a seminal uh, book that I was able to get my hands on at the time called A Myofascial Release Textbook, Unassuming Name. Now, Michael Shea is, was very, very ahead of his time, and he's still fortunately alive on the planet and doing tremendous teaching. Worked with infants. Uh, he created his um, 
own version of biodynamic cranial sacral, and his books are uh, a tour de force. And his concept that I just was like a lightning bolt for me was this statement, all soft tissue release is predicated on how the nervous system discharges its impulses. So what does that mean? We're gonna unpack that in a moment. But what it means is that you have system discharge that occurs when you do soft tissue release. And not only that, the system discharge, and if we talk about that in terms of parasympathetic and sympathetic, then this release is predicated a soft tissue wise on the discharge of the system. You must have a compliant nervous system to create any soft tissue change. Another factor of the nervous system, the writings of Hans Selle were very important. And if you haven't read about um, the general adaptation syndrome, you should Google this and, and have, a, have an idea because you understand, you've heard this of course, about flight, fight, fright, and fight versus rest and repose. And so really what we're, what we're seeing is, we're seeing that uh, we have individuals that come to our table who generally are in what, we would, what I would term high sympathetic dominance. And before you could create any soft tissue change, you have to regulate, down-regulate their, their system. And we're gonna see that often lighter touch is the mechanism to do that down-regulation. So as I was saying, if we unpack the autonomic nervous system in a greater detail, then we look at the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. Uh, they're not antagonistic, they're a continuum. And Shea stated that any stimulus, thought, or emotion that associates pain, anxiety, or fear will increase sympathetic tone. So just think about this. Someone comes in and if they're afraid or they have anxiety, you're not gonna get soft tissue release. So this is what's referred as a tone shift. Now, if your approach is too aggressive or too fast, this will increase sympathetic tone. And when sympathetic tone decreases, the parasympathetic then has the ability to rise. Now, this is what we would consider our optimal state for soft tissue change. It's the state in which the body regenerates and you can access a depth in not only structural manner, but also in a sy systemic manner that access more chronically held tension, soft tissue and trauma. Now, I'm sorry, there's a little background noise going on in the neighborhood here. So I'm gonna to try to talk over that and hopefully that will cease. These live webinars, I can't completely control my environment, unfortunately, and uh, sound travels here in where I'm living. All right, so let's look at the autonomic nervous system uh, expression, release versus discharge. And release versus discharge is that the autonomic nervous system discharges, uh, soft tissue releases. Uh, it is a continuum or a cycle, and the energy of soft tissue release then will shunt into the autonomic nervous system. And it will do so because it is predicated on bioelectric activity and bioenergetic level within the tissue. And it will do this also because as we trigger a discharge, it becomes a much broader based event, uh, a whole system or multi-system event. And this then is called discharge phenomena. So understanding that this is a continuation or a cycle is very, very, very important. Now, another thing that we do with fascial therapy is we begin to not only consider the autonomic nervous system, but we will consider lines of fascial tension as well. And there are many models for you uh, to work with. And of course, perhaps some of the most famous models is the Thomas Meyer uh, anatomy trains model. Now, science is telling us that some of his lines uh, aren't as accurate in terms of holding sort of that evidence-based model. But clinically, I found they've stood the test of time. So uh, 
I continue to teach uh, the cardinal line models, and that would be your superficial front, we're gonna see in a moment, your superficial back line, and your lateral line. Uh, these are cardinal lines of tension, they're fundamental, they uh, adapt to all the basic movement patterns, which are flexion and extension, abduction, adduction, generally. Um, but there are other models. Um, I've drawn in this workshop, you would be introduced to what's called uh, magic spots from Robert Schlieb. And these are just points on the body that you could assess routinely, uh, which are called high leverage points for fascial uh, contracture or adhesion. Um, but well, also what's really important, I think, is also Serge Paletti's book on um, fascial chains, trains and transfer points, where uh, Myers has bony stations and tracks, uh, Paletti has chains and transfer points. But with Paletti, you get a greater sense of how the joint plays with fascia. And I've, to that extent, uh, part of the foundations class has components on what I call fascial articulations. And fascial articulations are where we work with the joint and how it affects those cardinal lines of tension and obviously the more complex lines of tension. To that end also, we look at Lewis Schultz and the Endless Web. And what's really significant about the Endless Web, and we'll see some folks uh, photos in a moment, is the bands and straps that go circumferally around the body. Are you picking up those patterns? Are you looking for those type of restrictions in the overall fascial fabric? And if you're not, then basically uh, you just aren't getting as much mileage out of the change that you could get. Finally, of course, you can't make a conversation on fascia without talking about the stecos, uh, the, the work, uh, that they have done over the last 15 years is just extraordinary. And uh, Luigi Stecco in his first book um, had a really interesting, uh, they look at the helical and spiral patterns. And to me, the spiral patterns, <clears throat> excuse me, are very, very neglected. So let's look a little more here with uh, Paletti's fascial pulley and chain system. Uh, I find this to be one of the more uh, elegant uh, photos that you could possibly see. And since the fascial system is uh, continuous, and there's never an interruption, each gives into the next in a completely harmonious sequence. And the chains form a series of transfer points on the bones to enhance cohesion and improve fit efficacy. And so I sort of intuited organically that the joints were very, very uh, intimate with fascial change. And if I could do something to reduce capsular tension, then I could create some change to the fascial lines of tension. Again, we were talking about uh, tensegrity. So at the core, again, I believe of how we assess and treat is through thorough palpation assessment of the simple to complex patterns of soft tissue. And the pattern with palpation that I use to assess has always been a very, very user-friendly. Uh, the osteos picked this up very, very early in time uh, and it's called ease and bind. And so ease and bind is applied to assess the compress compression tension dynamic of joint motion. It's to uh, assess myofascial planes of distortion. Uh, it can look at the muscle tendon relationships, et cetera. So it's a real important way to um, work with palpation assessment and motion assessment. And, uh, and this is a another foundation principle in what I teach in uh, fascial therapy. And again, we'll look through uh, a few of the patterns. So this is a photo from the superficial back line of Thomas Myers anatomy trains. Um, and not only am I looking at patterns that are fascial, but I, of course we'll look at muscle patterns uh, you could later go into muscle subsystems, et cetera. But also you can look at these crossover patterns that we'll look at at some point, which will be the sling effects. So when you have a crossover from one side of the body to the next, uh, that's considered uh, working that ligament muscle sling pattern. Uh, here's the body straps that we were talking about, or I was mentioning about with um, Lewis Schultz. 
And these are functional anatomical uh, myofascial protection. He uh, reckoned they were segmentation armoring similar to that of an armadillo and holds each area rigid. And if you notice in particular, you have an eyeglass line, you have a collar line. You, this line is, well, women have worn uh, bras for eternity and they wear them quite a bit every day. So you can imagine that that particular band can get very restricted. And are you as a practitioner identifying the restriction and can you clear it? We have um, this um, waist band, we have an underwear line as you see. So that's more umbilical and this is more underwear belt and this is the line that goes to the front and if we obviously extrapolate the back, we have the ramic area basically from the abductor all the way around. And that area needs to be cleared and because this area can be very uh, obviously proximal to uh, genital area um, because of cultural and ethical uh, standards that we have in the West, uh, it's an area that's not often assessed or treated. Uh, these were the magic spots from um, Schlepp. Uh, it's another pattern of areas that you can look at. They, would, they will correspond with the lines. So what you'll notice is these areas are high leverage points. And even if you never you did work with the uh, myofascial lines, um, you could be doing work uh, with looking at these areas and trying to then with your fascial techniques to clear them. Again, another pattern to consider. And the more patterns you have at your disposal, often uh, the quicker the change, and if not the quicker the change, uh, the resolving of more complex presentations. I always love this because it really matches what we do a lot with myofascial taping, kinesio taping, kinesio taping. Um, and so what you have here is you can see that the fascia on the surface uh, behaves in um, very a uh, wrapping, just like you're putting a bandage on. Are you checking these directional restrictions? Well, we teach that in the fascial therapy course. Again, I'll quickly go through these. These are just uh, pictures from Meyer's anatomy trains. And there's your front line and your back line. And I guess one of the things that are really interesting about cardinal lines of tension is if you look on the front line, and it will also be on the lateral line, you have the sternocleidomastoid. Well, imagine if you're doing just direct work on the SCM um, and you're not getting any response to the muscle. Well, from this perspective then, and this particular bias of uh, instruction, maybe you should go back down to the high leverage points, the transfer points, the bony stations, whatever we want to call them, and uh, check if they're holding tension, clear them, and often you will find a change in the tonality of the sternocleidomastoid because it sits on two broad cardinal lines, lateral and front. So what you do in the pubis, theoretically, and probably even what I do uh, with dorsiflexion at the ankle, can improve a certain degree of flexion extension uh, on the SCM. So what I do with the lateral line could improve rotation or lateral flexion on the SCM. And this is sort of what I consider a lot more fun to work when you, you have a broader context for treating and you have more things to fiddle with. And of course, um, uh, your clients sort of wonder, what the heck are you doing when you're working down at the feet to do something with the neck? Uh, of course, with education and explanation, that's usually resolved. Uh, but they will have a moment of raising their eyes going, now what is this person onto? Because they're working a much more global approach with the pattern to try to take care of that regional problem. And so as we can see again, then there's more complex lines. There's your lateral lines on, on the left. You have the front and back line as a continuous. And you gotta remember these lines are not in isolation they're in three dimension. So what you're trying to do is you'll understand that if you do something to one line, you've affected some form of fascial tension to the others. But then where it gets more complex, and I have to take my hat off to Thomas Myers, is we have what's called spiral lines and deep front lines. So in the deep front line, I've, I've taught it out a course I'm gonna run this year on deep front line 
uh, architecture of the muscle structure and the fascial structure because it contains the psoas, the iliacus, the diaphragm, the adductors, the pectineus, the popliteus, and I can do something with the toe extensors to soften up a bit of the abdomen to get to the psoas. Why? Because there seems to be a, a, a really strong correlation of relationship between uh, the lack of flexibility and movement of toe uh, extensors and tightness in the psoas. Equally, which is a little less understood um, and a little more um, in the realm, uh, I dare I say, of pseudoscience, uh, because I'm, I'm really drawing from kinesiology now and evidence-based folks don't take any uh, kindness to kinesiology. But from a kinesiological perspective, um, the pelvis and the jaw have a relationship. The muscles and bones are paired in a sense. So often if I have a problem with the psoas, I can also work up into a medial pterygoid, do some work there and I'll find the psoas soften. I think it's just understanding that you have all these different patterns you can play with clinically uh, that can really start to make some changes. Now let's move into another concept. And this concept came from Errol Lederman in a superb book called The Science and Practice of Manual Medicine, I believe. And he um, really clarified for me sort of what, what a lot of the actual function and purpose of what we're trying to do and the physiology in a sense of soft tissue. And when he talked about tissue loading, he basically said that the two main forms of tissue loading are tension and compression. And then what comes off of that, in other words, what is more complex is a combination of tension and compre compression together. And this is where then you get your rotational elements, your bending elements, and your shearing elements. So some of this ends up being addressed to soft tissue, but some of the like, rotation is more about uh, spinal as well, but also myofascial. We know shearing elements are very important in terms of the releasing mechanism of myofascial. It's often that lateral hook that spikes up uh, particular uh, Ruffini or Pacini um, receptors, sensory receptors that are responding to tangential force. And shearing is that main mechanism that separates it often from uh, deep tissue muscle work. So these types of loading are, are really fundamental uh, to get the soft tissue receptors and particularly muscles, spindles, or a host of other uh, joint interstitial receptors or Pacini, Ruffini, Golgi, you really are working with a lot of receptor uh, response when you understand how you load the tissue. Now, when we load the tissue, uh, what we teach um, in our fascial therapy courses uh, are the variables in applying technique. So uh, the variables have the following elements that we will always need to be considered and adapted. The simplest, simplest variable is perpendicular downward or upward force that establishes depth. And there are some schools that are basically saying that you can't feel anything. Um, that what you uh, are feeling is inaccurate and delusional even in some circles, that you can't feel a knot, you can't feel, basically it's unreliable because it's your own subjective perception. Well, I don't know. I, I don't agree with that. Um, and that's fine. We can agree to disagree. I've taught thousands of practitioners through the years to use these variables and they seem to do just fine with them and put them into practice. Uh, some will have more perceptive ability than others. Uh, that's often a very much a skill development. And perhaps that's a discussion uh, we can talk about another time. But the simplest variable, as I said, is downward or upward force. And then you can put that downward or upward force on a pressure scale. Uh, and so if you're using full force quickly, of course the body's going to react and often go into a guard response or a splint. But if you're able to moderate that force and increase it at a, at a 
at a duration ability that gives you some control, then often um, the force will be accepted. One of the great things we often said about the difference between muscle and mild fascia is that muscle responds very quickly with higher force and fascia responds more slowly with lower force. And once you understand those basic principles, that's how you're applying your technique based on the tissue layer uh, you're attempting to access. Um, so force is a variable. Direction is, of course, a variable. Single or stacked, multiple directions, vectors. And we teach that in the uh, FT training with ease and bind barriers. The, as I said, the speed of the application because of the the load factor, if you load it too quickly, uh, fascia, it'll, be, it'll resist. If you go slower, it will yield. And finally, of course, the duration or time required to facilitate uh, soft tissue change. Oh, we've got somebody coming up here again. Let me look. Uh, okay, so the question is, how much crossover is there between my work and orthobiotomy? Uh, orthobiotomy, it seems like a lot. And uh, that's exactly true. Um, Years ago, I traded some workshops with a couple orthobiotomy instructors, and I investigated the work of Lincoln Arthur Pauls, who's fantastic. So, um, as I said, this work uh, dovetails with uh, lots and lots of different modalities. Of course, orthobiotomy um, affected what I, my thinking, but you have to also understand, I came to this before I was exposed to orthobiotomy. So I love sort of the organic, intuitive nature of what we as clinicians um, think about. And then the orthobiotomy decided to put uh, Lawrence Jones's tender points into play from strain counter strain. And Lawrence Jones, which I didn't put a lot in this one, uh, in this particular slideshow, uh, but the strain counter strain, um, the positional release technique is really instrumental. And he again had three really important concepts. And those concepts and principles I sort of co-opted. Uh, I didn't use the tender point uh, technique so much to do the, th the therapy application, but, um, and I, this should have been added actually, thank you so much for the question. Um, he had three main principles that he, uh, Jones, um, articulated from his work in strain counter strain and that was first find a position at ease second replicate the strain and third exaggerate the distortion so what happens with indirect and that's an indirect method what happens is instead of trying to pull tensely something out of it they actually would find the position where the strain was but a comfortable position and then they would exaggerate the position slightly, hang out, and you have an unwinding phenomenon. And we use P P PRT in the FT training quite a bit. Um, it's sort of uh, some, there's a little bit of official presentation about it, but often it's in, embedded in when you use ease and bind, because in the ease bind, what ease really is, is we use, uh, we'll get to this in a moment, uh, stacking fulcrums. So we find three planes of ease and we hang out with that. And that's just a fundamental PRT concept that's been embedded in FT training. Great question, thank you for it. Um, let's look at some secondary uh, variables. Um, multiple simultaneous directions. So we start to stack our vectors. You can begin to bring in oscillatory or vibratory uh, techniques as well to facilitate nervous system response. Um, we also, like Bowen, uh, we take our hands off the body. Um, we remove stimulus. And this is very, very important because remember I said the very first protocol for us is nervous system. And this allows us to have a communication with the nervous system to uh, use a a cause and effect, a call and response. So whether you believe it or not, or know it or not, every bit of touch is registered by the body. Uh, if we were taking an emotional psychological uh, perspective, touch could be really looked as intervention. And the potential for any tra trauma to come up is present. So therefore, 
understanding the power of touch in this particular case, the power of lighter touch is really, really so important. So we want to pace our work. I learned that from Shea in the early days, and he's got a set of monofascial principles. And one of them in there is you pace your work. You take your hands off and you observe. Now, my clients find that quite amusing uh, because often they don't understand it. Oh, we got another question coming in. Okay, let's see what we've got. Um, no, I guess we don't. Okay, let's go back. We'll take that off. Uh, we got another thing up here. This is the first time using, uh, okay, I don't need to do that. All right, let's continue. Um, okay, so that's why I sort of, let's talk about when you take your hands off, it allows the body to integrate. And in that integration time, um, that's when the release really is occurring. And so we teach in fossil therapy method to really observe the body to have a look at the body and look at the signs of what are called autonomic expression. So the releases of soft tissue not only require time, but also you are stimulating sensory receptors and you want that stimulation. There's a duration to it. You can't just snap your fingers and everything changes. It's not a magic wand. I wish it was. And sometimes to clients, it seems like it is, but you must understand that integration and pace or an essential component to creating change to soft tissue. Uh, and you cannot do that if you touch continuously. Now, if you're doing Swedish massage, and the purpose is a form of relaxation and uh, fluid circulation, well, that's a very different intent. So often we also talk about, well, what is our intent? What are we tr actually trying to do with the tissue? So uh, these secondary variables are really interesting and they become quite important and can be sometimes the most significant factor in some sessions. Well, let's move on a bit to looking at muscular patterns. So one of the things we also, of course, these days is everyone's pretty switched on these days to uh, muscle imbalance. And we know that because we have what the patterns are totally derived through being uh, either facilitate, muscles are facilitated or inhibited. And we know that through any of your trainings, through yoga or Pilates, uh, martial arts, if you don't have a core, uh, without a core, uh, muscles that shouldn't need to do the job are doing the job. And that's when we start getting into imbalances and uh, dysfunctions. So the brain doesn't function in individual muscles. It, it functions in orchestrated patterns. And if there's a problem, it just bypasses that particular muscle and creates another helper and that helper is where then there's problems. So often you're retraining your body. Pilates is a great example of really uh, retraining. Excuse me, <coughs> I'm gonna take a sip here. Um, really retraining the body to operate more efficiently and dare I say even correctly, um, so that you're using core muscles to do functions and they're using the right orchestrated patterns of muscles so that you have um, a body that can be upright in gravity with greater ease and elegance. Um, and so these are very important. And these Pilates trainings or yoga trainings, you can take straight to the table as well. You can really, with your understanding of muscle patterning and imbalance, you can utilize that in a soft tissue setting. Um, I've always been a fan of Vladimir Janda, and I know he's gone out of vogue with the current generation of physios and sort of his theories from the 90s aren't as relevant these days, but he really uh, did some really interesting things and he looked at, again, these patterns of, of muscle imbalance. And again, the, the upper and lower cross patterns are not proven to be as uh, reliable any longer evidence-based, but I think they're illustrative of just for uh, beginners to understand that not all muscles are the same. And I think if you're in a program that is just really basic and they're teaching you to uh, apply technique to muscles, you start to think that though that's how you solve everything is from a muscle centric approach. Unfortunately, it's not. But this allows you to look at sort of the difference between uh, tight muscles and weak muscles and weak muscles can be tight. They're just inhibited. So uh, that's, a, that's a misnomer sometimes for folks, because you would think often, uh, some people would think when 
muscle is weak, it's atrophied or it's not. But it can be quite tight. And that's the difference between concentric and eccentric loading, et cetera. Um, I really like to use, I use a lot of muscle energy technique in this practice modified. We're, we're going to use a lot of contract relax when we teach you the uh, FT methods. And I like to look at the complex relationships. And this one came out of Janda and it talks about compound movement relationships. So in the lower extremity, the extensor sling consists of the max, gluteus max, the rectus femoris, and the gastrocnemius for hip extension, knee extension, and ankle plantar flexion. The iliopsoas, hamstring, and tib anterior combine for hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. Now, why is this important? Well, imagine if you're treating one of those three structures uh, and you don't understand that those three structures work in a kinetic chain and that if there's a problem with one of those structures, you should also be checking the relationship with the other two structures, both proximal and distal above and below. And not only that, the antagonist of that. And so often if you're having problems with a hamstring, you really need to look at what, what basically is a flexor chain and an extensor chain. And the other thing that you can do is also you can use your uh, muscle energy technique, which I use extensively modified um, for joints in particular, but I will get three movements being contracted at the same time. I'll ask for any one of these and stack them. And often I will get a quicker change out of the muscles because I used more of what the kinetic gait was doing on the table than just a single muscle. And so, but this takes time to learn this and to also have the confidence to explore and play with these patterns. So we build simple patterns into more complex patterns. And again, this is just another slide of that uh, relationship of the flexor spring. Oh, we have a question. Uh, uh, okay, Julia, um, maybe towards the end, I will. Okay, um, I'll hold that one. Okay. Uh, Julia was asking, please talk about your experience unwinding or easing chronic long-term 10 years plus fascial tension, nerve impinge. God, that's a whole nother webinar, Julia. <laughs> but I'll see. Remind me at the end. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So let's go to, okay. So when you look at these kinetic chains, then what you're able to look at are sort of how tonic and phasal, phasic muscles work. And that when you have this sort of picture and you've got to treat something along one of these lines, well then, in my way of thinking, then this becomes a relationship with this from the wrist to the heel through the midline. So part of the difficulty for any beginner to sort of journey person, um, intermediate practitioner, let's say you've been practicing three to seven years and you're just taking in lots of information and you're having really great successes, but then you hit the wall, you know, with something. Um, understanding more complex chains allow your, your brain to sort of go, well, wait a minute now. I've treated that. I looked at that structure. Oh, maybe there's a relationship with this structure. And so what I teach fundamentally as well in the FT method is you benchmark things. You look through your assessment at what you're trying to change. You obviously clearly listen to the presentation and the complaint, but then you also pick something for yourself that you know would be really important to change, like femoral rotation, internal, external is stuck. Um, and you, all the techniques you do, you still go back and you double check. Well, did it internal and external rotation improve? Uh, do I have greater extension in the arm? And you can do that on the table. You can check it out passively. So that you, you're benchmarking something that you know is a fundamental movement in range that's restricted on this person. And you explore that in relation to their complaint. So that takes a little bit of time, but I'm often doing that. You know, I, I, and re, Believe me, your client knows their body better than you do. Um, please understand that. So often what they're saying to you is really important information 
uh, but no one's either listened or had the light bulb go on about that information because really what they're doing is trying to get you, the practitioner, to translate that information of pain or dysfunction and make sense of it through touch. That's quite an art form to really, for what we're doing with folks, to actually resolve their complaints. And I can talk about, at the end, endless stories. Uh, but let's continue on. This is a lot of material I'm deciding to unpack uh, this morning or evening with you. Now, let's get to muscle energy. So, uh, muscle energy came out of osteopathic tradition, and initially, the terminology muscle energy was actually explained as patient effort. And I think there was a misnomer with muscle energy in that people expected that muscle energy was applied to muscle. But when muscle uh, energy was first being form uh, formulated by Fred Mitchell in the 50s, um, then what he was really describing was to use a patient effort using an active contraction to create change to the receptors, either in joints or muscles. So this is a very important uh, assessment tool. And if you're not using your active uh, resistives or your contract relaxes, then you really are missing a big element in soft tissue and manual therapy. Um, obviously it's utilized to assess um, relative strength or weakness of muscles, but also I use it uh, tremendously for joint, and you would learn that in any of my trainings. Now, how do we exploit muscle energy to make change quickly? And Eric Dalton, Dalton uh, was the first one who wrote an article years ago for me, and he was calling use of a muscle energy or contract relax, and he called it uh, receptor enhancement. Now, I'm going to quote from his article, which is now an old article, I think it was written, I can't remember what, um, 90s, beginning of the millennia. Uh, anyways, as we can see here, um, recent advances in staining techniques reveal the presence of nerve receptors embedded in mild skeletal tissue. And they led to conclude that the ligaments, uh, joint capsules, the fascia, the discs, they all particip participate in neuromuscular reflexes, such as active balancing of the spine, when walking or standing, and that's considered proprioception. They warn the brain of pain-producing stimuli that may also cause tissue damage and inform the brain of stresses and strains. Now, those receptors are giving information. Therefore, from basically Dalton and receptor enhancement is that we, we might have the ability to manipulate those receptors. Uh, Janda taught that uh, the sensory motor system uh, motor development and control comes from the sensory motor system. And this is again, sensory and motor apparatus. And he said, look at, they're so intimate, they can't be functionally divided. So he emphasized the importance of proper proprioception. And so we can use proprioception in our treatment and can often help then restore imbalances to the muscular and fascial system. Now, how might we do that? Well, one manner is to also understand, to understand these receptors. So in a joint, you have at least these type one, two, three, and four types of joint receptors. And some of these overlap into muscle tissue, into ligament tissue uh, as well. Now, a Ruffini ends up being in the superficial layer of the capsule and it responds because the type of receptors can be high threshold, meaning high force or low threshold, and they respond to a lower force. Um, they can adapt quickly or adapt slowly. All this becomes a little more, you know, you have to do a bit more study on them. But essentially, let's cut to the chase. The chase is what do they respond to? So stretch. So Ruffini will do limits of rotation and stretch. So if you twist the joint and try to stretch it, that has a Ruffini response. If, like I've done for years, compressed joints ad nauseum to find out how they work, uh, that those are Pacini, passiform. If you want any kind of active tension, you're dealing usually with Golgi's. And then, of course, you have your nociceptors that talk about pain. So remember, a joint is monitoring uh, positional. A joint is monitoring tensional. A joint is looking at 
its position in terms of compression and tension, its position, and that has effect on the surrounding musculature. So often you can change muscle tonus when you change uh, a joint, uh, relax the joint or a ligament. And you can change muscle tonus, of course, when you also work uh, neural tension. Everything is intimate in relationship. I think it just takes time for you as a practitioner to start to understand why there's a complexity to why you can't get sometimes the muscle to change. And you, it's not about over frictioning it, which is sort of the go-to with a lot of beginners. So let's get back to Dalton. So Dalton said there's what he called activators and enhancers. So activators are application of fast paced muscle stimulating maneuvers using fingers, fists, forearms to activate to turn on weak muscles. So those are quick, contract, relax. You might do movement. There's a, a school of thought that if you uh, go to a belly and put your fingers together or pull them apart, one will relax and one will tonify. I mean, uh, Shaytow pointed that out in the early days in a lot of this text. Uh, you can do what's co-activator. In other words, we use co-activators a lot with using fingers and elbows on uh, like the hamstring origin to really go and get uh, the Golgi tendon organs to respond or to work spinal ligaments. There's nothing better than a, an SIJ getting an elbow on it just sustained. Why? Because the, the co-activator of that position allows that ligament to respond. And then enhancers are considered combining active and passive client movement. And one of the hallmark principles of uh, fascial therapy is always utilizing active and passive, not one or the other alone, that the nervous system likes the novelty of change and it responds accordingly. So that if you use an active range and a passive range, you're going to be more successful than if you just used one or the other uh, alone. Now, when we teach it then, this was uh, a younger version of myself. Uh, this was done in uh, Edmonton in Canada in 09, winter's day. And uh, we were playing with uh, what I call receptor enhancement. So in my workshops, if I want to get a spine to relax quickly, uh, I'll use a form of leverage either with the humerus or the femur, uh, the humerus for the thoracic spine and the femur for the lumbar spine, and we will um, use a simple low threshold force, 10% or under, sometimes only five, doing cardinal directions of movement. So going down, up, dut, dut, squeeze together, pull apart. And that was designed to work the middle of the thoracic spine, especially if we're trying to do a slump test or we're trying to do, God knows what we're going to try to do with the thorax. This is a door opener. And it's usually a wow moment in the FT workshops because after you've done this, then the arm drops like that. Not only the arm drops, you can pick up these, the, any of the men or women that do a lot of weight training and they can't bring their elbows together. By the end of that, the elbows are together, everything's down and relaxed. And this, this is so efficient. It may be short term, obviously, and in some cases it's long term, but it gets you what I call the door opener. And if you want to create change, you got to find what I call the door opener. The door opener is getting complex tight tissue to yield so it can get in and do something with it and go deeper. And the door openers, um, you know, when you only have an hour with a person or a half hour, um, it's how you're using your technique to create soft tissue change quickly. And of course, uh, if they have high sympathetic dominance, you can't do that. You have to lower that dominance before the techniques can come into play. But if that dominance is lower, you can take someone who's very bulky and bigger than you because your fingers can't change that uh, using compression and friction. You've got to use how to use your uh, contract relaxes uh, because they're much more reflex oriented. You're dealing more sophisticatedly with receptors. So we also then talk about joints a bit. And this was drawn from, um, uh, this should say joint play and with Sharon Giamatteo. I'm sorry, the header is a little confusing. But she wrote a, a series of books called Integrative Manual Therapy, um, which are really excellent texts. I, I gained so much out of those. Uh, she states there are three concepts of equal importance 
although the, the variables of significance for different clients. These are joint mobility, articular balance, interarticular space, and vertical balance. And if she goes into greater detail about all of these, so the mobility of the joint, the position of balance of the bones, and mostly what I see in practice is humeruses that are anteriorly rotated and downwardly placed because of our posture when they should be back further and up. Femur has the same, and if you can even just gently reposition a joint, you'll get receptor response almost immediately and soft tissue change. That's a door opener. Uh, so articular balance is important. Uh, the space, because the rubbing of the bones um, are of great importance. Of course, arthritis is nothing but degeneration and rubbing. Um, and then the vertical balance is what she's replying to as being upright uh, in gravity. Um, we also employ a lot of what I call direct and indirect methods. And direct would be more your actives and your indirect would be more your passives. But uh, your indirect could also be holding technique. Um, direct are basically modalities and techniques that uh, directly impact soft tissue uh, by engaging the, uh, the greatest degree or direction of resistance uh, on a barrier, both through palpation and motion and indirect um, are modalities that indirectly soft through the nervous system. So your craniosacral work, your holding technique, I teach a two point protocol. Um, this allows you to, to drop that sympathetic dominance into parasympathetic. And, um, you know, it's under their uh, usual perceptual awareness. It's under their ability to feel. So these um, active and passive direct and indirect methods are used all the time in fascial therapy. They're blended together. Uh, it makes more of for efficient use of time. It makes for a oh, quicker, quicker response, basically. Okay, how you guys doing? I've got a load of stuff I'm presenting today. Um, this is a, a lot of material, and, uh, and the good news is it'll be recorded. So if you get bored or tired, you know, it's like a, a long uh, TV show or movie where you get an intermission. In the old days, in the 70s, uh, when the TV, were they, the long shows, they'd have an intermission where you take a break. So understand that uh, your intermission is, uh, if you need to take a break, uh, this is being recorded in the cl cloud and, uh, you know, you can come back to it. All right. So um, following up with direct and indirect, following up with active and passive, then Liederman really talks about what passive does for you, the therapist, and what active does. Passive is always uh, a therapist moving the structure without any assistance. And let me tell you, that's an art form because most people are in control of their own bodies. So good luck doing range, right? Because they tend to guard. And their default setting is guarding. So that's what you're up against. You're trying to change tissue where there's a default setting of holding that's inherent in the tissue. And you've got to uh, attempt to change it. Active, of course, is simply the client supplying the effort or activity, but you've got to modify that. How many times has someone pushed and they went full tilt boogie and they pushed way too hard and you couldn't do anything with that. And one, they were too strong for you and they almost hurt you. So you always have to clarify to a client the amount of force that you're asking for and get them to modify it down. So they'll press in some manner and I go, do half of that. And they'll press again and go, no, no, do a little more half of that. Okay, now add a little more. And next thing you know, you've got them sort of at that 5% of their force, whatever that may be. And you now have control and you're getting the receptors to respond. So this is a very important uh, classification for us to consider uh, in principles from uh, the FT method. Again, we could use that active passive in another terminology and we can call it dynamic and static. Uh, dynamic involves joint movement, static, uh, the joints are immobile. Dynamic would be, could have active resistive oscillation and there's different schools of how you use this and static is more the holding. Uh, I didn't change the ISTR, that used to be integrative soft tissue release uh, and then I rebranded a few, about three years ago now, to fascial therapy. Uh, so that one's still in there. 
Uh, static and active would be MET or active resistance. So again, just thinking about what you're trying to use with these techniques. Now, uh, one of the, I used to teach this in the very beginning of the EFT courses, but people were a bit lost with my instruction, which is probably any of my former students know that I do have a tendency to go off on tangents. So um, I started adding this in day two or three in the four day international courses where you use the holding technique, because when I'm teaching a, an audience that are mostly physiotherapists, uh, they come in with a much more stronger evidence-based bias. Uh, I have to sort of match my teachings to where a practitioner is in the reality of what they're doing. Um, I'm not trying to convince them uh, to agree with me. I'm not trying to convince anybody to believe like I believe. Uh, you basically have to understand where people are coming from and where their skill set is, and then can you work with that and bring um, bring influence in a in a constructive manner uh, to their you know to their workspace, and, and that being getting outcomes with clients. But once I can get them to the holding technique, uh, and they see what it does, then they begin to see the implications of where they can use it. So holding technique has always been uh, the two point. And we use that to create parasympathetic effect. And so being uh, is as potent as doing. And the art is to read the nervous system to know when to utilize uh, holding techniques. So then we look at structural patterns along with holding. And our assessment protocol uses you know, basic um, functional screens like a forward bend, a trunk rotations, squats, you, know, you name it, very simple patterns to look at uh, and make sense of the various relationships of the soft tissue to function. And um, we tend to organize this over uh, myofascial tension patterns, assessing both global and regional. Uh, we look at joint motion patterns. We look at muscular, as I said, ligament and neurodynamic interfaces. Um, the purpose, again, is to work all the tissue. Now, this is now more of a reiteration. Um, in the fundamental class, when we're working on the surface of the skin, uh, many of my students know this one to be really true, is we, what we do is we use uh, how do we locate the fascia. Uh, superficially, you have the skin, and if you take your fingertips very gently and push just into the first layer of muscle and back off, you're below the skin and above the muscle, and that's where you work on the superficial fascia. Um, and that's considered a first level of restriction. Uh, and understand that fascia is malleable. That um, uh, if you uh, go really quickly, uh, it will be kind of be rigid, but if you are a little gentler with it, not completely gentle, I don't mean you have to be soft, but you have to understand the form of the tissue. Not only can you press tissue of fascia, you can lift it. And especially if you're on an abdomen with someone who has uh, what I tend to term a little more girth and a little more Buddha belly, if you so to speak, and that's not being judgmental, it's just the morphology of the individual. Uh, you're more inclined to get changed out of the fascia if you learn uh, to first do a lifting and grasping technique and then a press and a shift, and you can get that tissue just to let go really quickly. Uh, folks in my workshops and in my classes have seen that time and time and time again. And it's a very simple technique, but understanding that you can use that instead of trying to press your way through means you're reading the tissue much more correctly. So where do the fascial tissues uh, restrictions reside? Well, uh, the old school, and it's what we teach with the patterns, uh, is at the bony prominences and the musculotendinous junctions. Uh, and they're always felt when we're using what we call fascial distortion, we're always taking the skin and we're doing what call ease and bind. So if you do this on yourself, uh, if you put a flat hand on the forearm and you go one way and you go the other, there's a direction that moves more freely and a direction that doesn't. And that is that in that plane, there's a, a direction where you're moving and the direction you're not moving. So if you're not moving that way, the restrictions up here. If you're not moving that way, the restrictions over here. And so once you understand those very basic patterns, then we apply technique to that. And that's at the most fundamental level 
of restriction that we do. Um, but then, you know, the art is then how long do you hold the technique? And in fossil therapy method, we, you know, have to teach you. And sometimes it takes a while to get that. And if there's one sort of learning curve where it's the most difficult in training, it is how long to hold the technique because not everybody feels the change. So that's why assessment's really important. You have to go back. You have to go back and, you know, sort of reassess it. Um, and in that reassessment, that's where you'll see the change in the in the skin movement. And it means you've actually worked that plane and opened it up. And again, as I was saying, with connective tissue, low force and long duration, muscle, high force and short duration. So again, uh, th that's a bit of a reiteration. Um, ease and bind, we use soft tissue loading. These are concepts that um, we work with. And then uh, with fascial articulation, we start to work with levers. So here's a little bit of the ease and bind protocol that we work in the course. And again, a very simple concept of assessing in two manners, uh, the direction of the restriction uh, and the direction of the motion. So we can find ease and bind using joints. Or we can find ease and bind on the surface. And to that end, I tend to work more in ease, which is indirect, yeah, rather than in bind, which is direct. One, it's easier for me. Two, it's under the threshold of the client. Um, and therefore, their nervous system tends to be more compliant. Again, as a reiteration, uh, we can tension load. Uh, in tension loading, forces are applied in opposite directions, causing tissue to elongate. And the form of loading is used to lengthen shortened tissues and break down excessive crosslinks and traction, longitudinal cross fiber stretching, uh, fascial grasps are all your tension loading. In compression loading, uh, we use what I call statics. And we, you know, and just understanding these dynamics uh, allow you uh, to have touchability. Um, if you're just compression loading only, uh, you really aren't going to work three dimensionally very well. You can't unwrap tissue just pressing. Uh, you must sort of figure out how to use rotational and circle and twisting elements and torsion and shearing. All those have to be sort of taught to you to combine. So therefore, uh, when we teach a basic class with the direct uh, myofascial applications, um, the tension applications are fascial grasp. The wonderful skin roll uh, on the back is a great one for tension application. Uh, most of you are used to cross hand stretches but we also can do extremity pulls as well. So uh, when to use a tension application over compression, uh, which is uh, using ease bind, but basically I teach my, my students to decide which is easier, a press or a grasp, a press or a, a light lift squeeze. Whatever is easier is the one you take, and that's considered the ease concept. So uh, you can go across a hamstring group, and if it's easier to grasp it and do something with fascia to lift, that's what you do. If it's easier to press, that's what you do. And you can read this tissue very quickly instead of trying to press everything into oblivion. Okay. So there's a little bit of how we do the static compressions. Uh, again, we're just working fundamentally with particular points on the line. Uh, these then become more comp compound statics. Instead of just two hands on one spot, we may have two hands on the trochanter and on the rib cage, and we begin to move very quickly from a, a simplest technique into more complex patterns. And again, the, uh, the variables are provided here um, for compression formula and just making sure you're understanding I've always told my students that uh, position is technique. So we put the body in various sideline positions to assess these and binds so that you're not just stuck thinking you only do it one way. And so this is the benchmarking. This is the comparison that you do. Um, we use a lot of leverage in fascial therapy, and I teach that uh, very early on. And we use them both in what's called short and long uh, position. Um, and so that's often practice starts at the uh, femur, 
and the tibia because the pelvis is a much more stable base to learn and feel uh, compression releases. And then we move up to the uh, scapular complex and the humerus uh, where it's much more mobile and you have to create more support uh, where the pelvis creates just the base of support. You have to have one hand blocking the bone and another hand working it in different positions. And then we would feel those different changes. Here's an example of compound levering. And so I do a lot of what's called paired levering. Uh, this paired levering not only works uh, the hip joint and the shoulder scapula joint, it works the spine and the rib cage and the pelvis. So uh, we use a push pull. And so we'll check an ease bind on a lever and we might have a push pull, might have an ease in pull and and they may have an ease in push. And then I use a, a counter resistive. So what happens here is I'm holding it. I may place it in a pull direction and they pull back against my pull. And I might push here and they might push forward there. In other words, I always have a push pull dynamic going uh, between the two. And I'm able to get some really quick uh, changes. And we teach the leverage tension in the FT courses, and these are, again, called paired extremity levers. Um, we mentioned in the FT course muscle firing patterns. Um, sometimes I instruct that, sometimes I don't. Um, it just depends on sort of the time elements. There's so many components to talk about. A lot of people, uh, especially my physiotherapy audience, um, already know their muscle firing patterns. So we look at particular patterns if they come up, and we explore them if they're necessary. Um, so again, reiterating the techniques in fascial therapy, uh, we have uh, static compressions, we have two-pointing, which is used for the uh, parasympathetic response. Uh, we're going to talk about fulcrums in a moment, and we use uh, leverage compression. Uh, when we do the two-pointing, we sit quietly, and there'll be a, a a module in the workshop where you're going to just do a listening technique um, and you're going to work these on particular points called uh, diaphragms, uh, not just only the respiratory diaphragm, but joint structures and deeper transverse planes. And you're going to see the effect it has to do this gentler work. Again, this is a reiteration of the statics and here we begin to show the leverage compressions and all this is fundamentals in FT. Um, again, attempting to have a three-dimensional approach as we work. Some of this is reiterating. And then let's get into stacking. So we can begin to use, uh, once we understand the uh, myofascial lines of tension, we can do front and back. And uh, we can use those together to stack, and I'll teach you how to do that. Okay. Uh, the fulcrum. All right. We're almost done. Um, fulcrum is a really interesting thing I got from Sharon Giamatteo and others, but she was really good. Uh, I now teach with two fulcrums. One is called uh, a glide fulcrum, where we're attempting to change the fascial tissue. And a fulcrum is nothing more than uh, putting together three planes of ease. And so if you go like this, if that's ease, and then the left and right, and whatever the ease is, that creates an L, and then you put a twist on in ease. And you hold those three planes together statically for about 90 seconds. Now, if you want to glide the tissue, then you rub it all over and you've done the surface. But if you're trying to do something deeper, say you do this on the umbilicus, you do it in a spot where uh, you're not getting a lot of change on, and you're using then the application of three planes of distortion on the surface to get change depth. And a good example is the abdomen and umbilicus. If you want to create change to a lumbar spine, uh, instead of just trying to hammer through the back door there with the er erectors, uh, you can go through the abdomen very gently and create softening of the low back. I'll teach you that in the workshop. Uh, these are applied then for the transverse planes, and so these are the areas that we utilize uh, the two-point to work the pelvic floor, the umbilicus, the respiratory, thoracic inlet outlet, glenohumeral, we do hyoid work in this first course. So I'll teach you how to palpate the throat uh, very in a relaxed, uh, safe manner using lighter touch. 
and then you're able to get, gain your confidence and understand that the, the throat really needs to be addressed anteriorly. It's an underworked area. Uh, we two-point the abdomen. We do the respiratory. Uh, I'll teach you how to do hyoid releases and we'll locate some of the hyoid structure. Uh, and then we'll do cranial base. So this is sort of, this is when you put people to sleep sort of mode. Um, and then we're almost done. We finish again with a reiteration of long levers. And so we teach uh, these fundamentals uh, in the first class, uh, what's considered a neutral position. We do uh, sleeve twists with compression uh, and levering at the same time. So that's sort of chewing gum and rubbing your tummy at the same time. So some students find this one a little difficult, but um, we tend to master that in the class. We work with uh, levering uh, for external and internal rotation, both compression and tension. And again, I have all the protocol for you to, to try to be successful to uh, use this form of quick change to the joint, SIJ and the hip joint. Um, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly now um, because this is really a reiteration and I, I know you've used your precious time to attend with me. So um, we're just about done and we do some uh, compound techniques. Uh, you can see I, I've got some different tricks with, uh, I use a lot of sideline to do scapular movement and uh, to work both the scapula and the humerus and the clavicle and the SC joint. So I figured out some really good uh, techniques to clear those fairly quickly um, because that's an area that gets sort of undertreated, especially SC, AC. Uh, so um, I'll teach you how to do that. And then the next webinar uh, is going to be on neurofascial mobility. I've done one just last week with the Jing Institute. And I'm going to redo that one and uh, talk about what the neurofascial courses are. So uh, here's now, you can find out more information about me or with me. Um, we have an online course for the neurofascia, and I'm still working on the uh, fascial therapy online course. I have older videos on Vimeo, if you're interested. Uh, you can get me on the website. Um, uh, there's a Facebook group. There's a Facebook business page and there's a Facebook group. Uh, the Facebook group is, uh, I forgot to put that down there, is Fascial Therapy uh, Institute Australia. So if you just find that uh, Fascial Therapy Institute Australia, uh, you'll be able uh, to find me on the Facebook. So let's go see what we've got going here with questions. Um, let's see if there's anything else. No, nope. uh, if you have any more questions, if you're still with me, uh, this is the time. Julia, all right. If you Are you still with me, Julia? If you are, I will um, talk about unwinding. All right. Um, I haven't talked about unwinding in a long time. Uh, do you have a more specific question about unwinding? Because it's a, a sort of a complex phenomenon. Um, so why don't you formulate a, uh, I'll try to talk about it generally. Okay. So unwinding is a really interesting beast in a sense. It's the nervous system, in my uh, opinion, holding stored energy. Now, a good example is when you're taking range of motion around and you feel like you're moving it, but as you're moving it, it feels like they're actually moving it. But if you tell them, oh, could you let go? They'll go, what do you mean I have let go? They, they're, they're perceiving that you're moving it. So you have this interesting inherent tension sitting in the tissue. Um, so when you're doing sort of myofascial joint on one thing, excuse me, you may take that joint through using movement as the vehicle for release. In other words, They've got to move it out. They've got to move it out. It's got to go in different directions. And you're playing with that and seeing if there's congruence in that movement. And it will often feel like, yeah, you're moving it, but they're actually moving it. And it might even increase in speed. Now, the problem with that is you've got to control it. It's like a wild horse trying to run out of the corral. And you can get into some real mischief with that form of unwinding. So there's a real dynamic unwinding 
But then there's also sort of a subtler unwinding, and this might be what um, Julia is alluding to, and I'll go back to the question one more time to sort of look at it. And that is sort of when you feel tissue taking you on a dance of movement. And now maybe the movement isn't that gross, but it feels as if it's going through space and taking on different directions. And again, that is inherent tension in the body, in my opinion, through unwinding this, trying to escape, trying to use movement as a vehicle and a technique for soft tissue change and nervous system release. So if we go back in and we look at the Q&A, um, easing chronic long-term 10 year plus fascial tension, nerve impingement bound versus short-term conditions with PTSD clients. Wow. Well, Julia, you really are asking for a real specific one and maybe uh, what we need to also do, I'll do my best with this. Maybe we need to also have a conversation about that sort of individually because uh, it's a complex question. Um, okay, if people are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, you sort of have to understand what you're handling here. Uh, there is a lot of trauma, a lot of emotional release in play. Um, Oh, it's more about my experiences, short-term pathologies versus longer-term conditions, James. Um, yes, I did mention guarding. Uh, rigid bracing. Okay. Well, um, that's a good question, and I'll tell you. Um, I have folks that come in with high anxiety. It sounds like a Mel Brooks comedy. If you grew up with Mel Brooks like I did, it's Young Frankenstein and all these crazy ones. But high anxiety is a client coming in with a nervous system presentation that's overlapping a chronic pain presentation. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Um, the pain presentation uh, does not allow for the resolution of the soft tissue dysfunction because anxiety is co-augmenting the continuation of the pain. So that gets us back to working with lighter touch in the nervous system. So you can't make any impact on that soft tissue if you can't lower sympathetic dominance, pure and simple. So you must have techniques and strategies in play using your voice, using your manner, uh, confidence and experience to some extent that you can calm them. And that when they calm, the pain can start to subside and then you get to the heart of the pain uh, as their, their own nervous system starts to deregulate into parasympathetic. A lot of people get really mad at their body and their body parts. They're angry, they're frustrated. Well, if that frustration's in play, you can't get soft tissue pain. You've got to bring awareness to the fact that the, the use of their language and their narrative is often, oh, the shoulder, oh, I hate the shoulder. What's going on with this shoulder? What, why is this shoulder going on? You know, what's the story with my shoulder? And I say, well, you often got to have a love affair with that shoulder. You got to, you got to reacquaint yourself that that's your shoulder and you better be nice to it because if you're nice to your shoulder, you're calming your system. Now that sounds funny and it may even sound screwy, but often the, the, the kernel of truth involved in that is that they have disconnected themselves from themselves. Uh, and they want to just sort of partition themselves off. And that's what pain does to us. It partitions us off so we can function. But we can't get soft tissue change if that occurs. So you have to figure a way for them to, to lower that pain so they can reacquire perceptual awareness to the area. And in that, then, they're able to facilitate the first glimpse that there's a possibility of life without pain. Uh, I see the pain personalities come up all the time in my practice. And it usually takes me four sessions sometimes to get them to smile again. And then I'll go, Hey, this is you. This is you. This is the person I haven't seen yet. And the reason of course they're smiling is the pain has lessened. So when you're dealing with these complex PTSDs and um, trauma, uh, your nervous system approach is probably the most important and it takes precedence over uh, the soft tissue approach until and also co-opting their trust that they won't be living for the rest of their life in pain. So I'm gonna to start to wind this up. I'll just look at the last questions. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, 
well, you know, you can email me, you can text me, we can continue these discussions further. Uh, I just want to again, thank you so much uh, for um, attending this and uh, this webinar. I hope it's been beneficial uh, and, and I hope it'll attract you to the approach that I teach. So once again, everyone, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the live. And this is going to go out to folks uh, as a recording. And um, I'll post these links and I'll have Christy send out to those of you that signed up through ManyChat on Messenger, uh, the link to watch this in your leisure. So I'll check the last of this. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, no, Emanuela. Um, at this point, I'm not doing a lot of workshops in Australia. Um, got a long history of frustration with workshops in Australia. So I'm happy to entertain. Uh, if you can tell me uh, through text uh, uh, if um, where you're at, are you Melbourne based or somewhere else? I am going to be doing uh, a couple of workshops through Massage and Myotherapy Association in June and July, one in Melbourne on Deep Frontline and one in Queensland, I believe, on, I have to write that course yet, on the spine, a fascial therapy approach. And locally, I'll be doing two uh, continuing education courses for the Gordon in uh, June and July, and then later in the year uh, in, out of Geelong in Werribee. And they're going to be on uh, joint mobilization and on uh, deep frontline work. So I actually am going to be doing some courses. Uh, oh, Tasmania. Okay, keep an eye on the website. Yep, please. Um, so there are some short courses, uh, mostly one dayers. Uh, that I'll be doing here. Uh, on most of my longer courses are now international overseas. And uh, I've attempted many times to get longer courses up, but I don't know. Who, who can say? I'm always open to come somewhere. So there you go. Thanks again, everyone. Any last questions before I sign off here with you? Um, thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Julia. You guys take good care. Have a great day. I'm going to stop the share. Bye-bye.